It's an industry that's revolutionized every area of entertainment, from television to sports to movies. The video game business rakes in more than $20 billion a year, making bigger bucks than even Hollywood. This industry was created on products that were so exciting that people would stay up all night outside a store to get it the next morning. But how did two lines and a dot turn into the high-tech, hyper-realistic worlds of games like The Sims and Halo? It's not just about circuit boards and chips. It's about people, driven by vision and obsession. Video games to me is my whole life. That's all I've done since I was 12. It's about games that have been blamed for making kids antisocial and violent. If you play too much Doom, you're going to end up going on a shooting spree. There's really people who believe this. It's about feuds, wars, and even a little bit of good old-fashioned piracy. If they were going to copy our stuff, we were going to bury them, one way or another. But most of all, it's about how a whole generation grabbed the joystick and got juiced up on video gaming. The secrets behind the games, the passion that powered the industry, and the guys who made it happen. Video games. For some people, they're a blast from the past. Something they used to do at the local arcade when they were hanging out after high school. But for others, video games are the new technological frontier. An innovative form of communication and storytelling, and the future of entertainment. Hi, I'm Tony Hawk. A lot of you are probably used to seeing me with a skateboard and looking a little something like this. And a lot of you gamers are even more used to seeing me like this. I got into video games early on, even before I got to be a video game character myself. In fact, I don't think I even had my first board yet. And where could you find me? Playing Pac-Man down at the pizza parlor. But games have come a long way since then. And if you think the history of the video game invasion is all about cool graphics and cutting edge technology, well, you're right. But it's also a story about a group of unique individuals who started with nothing but ideas. Guys who came out of their garages and ended up as power players in a multi-billion dollar industry. Who revolutionized entertainment and turned themselves into rock stars. And the first rock star of them all was this guy. This is Willie Higginbotham. He helped invent the nuclear bomb. And the first computer game. The bomb looked like this. The game looked like this. A primitive version of tennis. It was just a dot moving back and forth on an oscilloscope screen. It showed up as a novelty exhibit at Brookhaven National Lab in 1958 and generated about as much excitement as this picture. Mortal Kombat, it was not. Fast forward, 1961. Student and pioneering hacker Steve Russell, nicknamed Slug. He spent six months tapping into a $120,000 computer at MIT. End result, a punch card driven video game called Space War. He was the one who conceived the idea of making a game that would be completely interactive. It was a game where there were two rockets, a game where Flash Gordon style rockets that would fly around shooting each other with a sun in the middle that had some gravity. If it sucked you in, you got destroyed. Space War spread to universities around America on an early version of the internet. But would the average Joe spend 120,000 bucks to own one? Slug figured, no way, and never patented the idea. He left MIT without graduating. Jump to 1966. A little device called television had made it into almost every living room in America. It was a cultural phenomenon, but to Ralph Baer, Vice President of Engineering at electronics giant Sanders Associates, it was a business opportunity. The concept was this, 40 million TV sets out there in the U.S. alone. If I could hit 1% uh, of that, that's 400,000, and attach some gadget to 400,000 sets, I got a business. Bear needed his play device to fit on a shelf. So that didn't give his little brown box much room for processing power. He wasn't doing much better than old Higgy, just two dots moving on a screen. No way this was going to set the world on fire. Then it hit him. A blockbuster breakthrough that would blow the roof off of home entertainment forever. 
three spots. The third spot became a ball that made it into a ping pong game or into a tennis game. Once we had that third ball going back and forth, we knew we had something. By 1971, Bears bosses had patented the brown box and licensed it to television manufacturer Magnavox. Now called Odyssey, it began showing up at various trade fairs around the country. The yeah, Odyssey was the hit of the show, and I had a hard time not getting up in my seat and jumping up and down and saying, that's my baby. The system is called Odyssey, and the hardware consists of a master control and two player control units connected by cable to any set 18 inches or larger, black and white or color. The players will simply switch to an unused channel, select their game, insert the program card in the control box, and place the overlay on the TV screen. So for instance, if you were playing a tennis game, uh, this would actually, using from, from static electricity, would cling to the front of your, your television. So this would, would be the overlay for a hockey game. The Odyssey hit store shelves in May 1972 and sold for 100 bucks. And hey, if you wanted to pop for another 29 bucks, you could also buy yourself this wicked weapon and play the first ever shooter video game. Seems that even then, guns and video games were destined to be together. And to convince America how hip it was to own an Odyssey, Magnavox got the king of cool, old blue eyes, Frank Sinatra himself, to pitch the product. Unfortunately, in the beginning, they connected it to a Magnavox television set, of course. That got the idea abroad that uh, you needed a Magnavox television set to play games. And they had to undo that by convincing customers in the store that no, you could indeed plug it into any TV set. It took over a year, but Magnavox managed to hook up about 150,000 Americans and their televisions to an Odyssey system. Next player in the game, Nolan Bushnell, an employee of a Northern California electronics firm. He'd played Slug Russell's Space War at engineering school and couldn't get it out of his brain. They actually thought, hey, this would be great in the amusement park, but how do you put a million dollar computer into it and pay for it at 25 cents a throw? Remember, the microprocessor hadn't been invented yet. And then one day, the mini computer for $5,000 came across my desk, I mean, the ad for it. I had the epiphany of being able to reduce it to a single board that was actually a uh, fancy signal generator, if you would. In 1971, Nolan's first video game, Computer Space, hit American Pinball Arcades. Sleek, sexy, and we all remember the first time we played it, right? Right. It was one of the biggest turkeys of all time. The problem with the game was that I loved it, all my friends loved it, but all my friends were engineers. It was a little bit too complex for the guy with a beer in a bar. Nolan's next move, taking 500 bucks and starting his own company in Santa Clara, California with buddy Ted Dabney. The year was 1972. The company was called Atari. Atari comes from the Japanese game of Go, which is a polite warning saying, watch out, you're going to get whacked. <laughs> First big hire, engineer Al Alcorn. Nolan, proving he already had what it takes to be a great corporate executive, landed Al by lying to him. He told me he had a contract with General Electric to build a consumer video game, a home video game, which was like almost impossible to do in those days. And the fact that nobody from General Electric ever came by or called or wrote us a letter didn't occur to me. I was too busy building the prototype. We decided to give him a test game. I'll call it a throwaway game, but something that was simple. Basically, ping pong, two paddles on either side, ball moving between them. Man, does this sound familiar. But remember, it was still early in 1972, and the Odyssey hadn't hit store's shelves yet. The concept was still fair game, and Al had his own spin on the idea. One of the things I discovered is that if the ball didn't speed up, it wasn't fun to play. So I added the ball speed up to the game. And the other thing that, that we did uh, at the very end was the sound. And since I was already way over budget, I poked around and found tones that were already existent in the machine. And that became the sound. 
we said, okay, let's call it Pong. And we put it in Handicaps Tavern in Sunnyvale, California. This baby here is the original Pong prototype that went to Handicaps Tavern in Sunnyvale and it has the original wire wrap that I built in three months in 1972. We put it in a box, put it up on the barrel. It was an immediate hit. We weren't aware of just how much of a hit it was until we got a service call and found that the coin box had totally filled up and wouldn't take any more quarters. Those are the kind of technical problems that we can solve. Here we have one of the uh, first quarters that the Pong machine ever made, which now represents a multi-billion dollar industry, and uh, it's in a little piece of plastic. Atari started rolling out their machines in November of 1972, and America went Pong crazy. There were several reasons the Pong was very successful. The first one was it was extremely easy to play, but very, very difficult to master. They had to pay a lot of money to get really good. The second one is that women found that they were better players than men. It turns out that women have better small motor coordination than men do. And it became socially acceptable for women to ask men to come over and play Pong. More players meant more machines, and Atari needed more manpower to build them, fast. We tried a few social experiments with running buses into undesirable parts of the town and giving people a chance to come and have a job. It was kind of a rude awakening from some of our age of Aquarius belief structures. They hired whoever they could hire in the beginning which meant they got a lot of bikers. Uh, you talk to some of the straight-laced people and they talk about being scared to walk the floor. They talk about going into the bathrooms and seeing used needles and stuff on the, on the ground. The converse is the 20% that stayed with us really appreciated the opportunity, became some of our most valuable employees. But who wouldn't want to work at a company where the bonuses came in beer kegs and strategy meetings were held in hot tubs? Since we had a lot of young people, we would constantly offer to throw a party if they hit quota. And it turns out when you've got 18, 19, 20-year-olds, they're much more interested in the party than an extra, you know, 50 cents an hour. So we got known as a party company. There's a story that if you walked by the Borrega Street building and you breathed deeply uh, by the air vents, you'd get stoned because the pot smoking inside of it was so heavy. It was a very laid-back culture, which is very important in a creative environment. I mean, you can't really punch the clock and come up with something creative. It didn't seem to matter what was going on inside Atari, because on the outside, they'd become the kings of the 60-year-old arcade business. And in America, how do you know when you've really made it to the top? When people start suing you. It wasn't long before Atari got hit with their first lawsuit. And it came from Magnavox, who claimed that Pong violated Ralph Baer's Odyssey patent. I looked at the patent and I said, my God, this guy's patented the idea of any kind of a moving object on a video screen controlled by anything, and it was filed in 1969. Well, the Magnavox was based on analog technology, which made it fuzzy, didn't have sound, didn't have score. I mean, you didn't really feel like you were beating somebody when you beat them which is one of the core essence of what a game is. But hey, what about those Magnavox trade show demos? Nolan Bushnell played a game, in Berlin game, in California on May the 24th, I think, 1972. He signed the guest book, uh, played the ping pong game. Bushnell decided to accept Magnavox's offer of a settlement. Atari paid Magnavox just under a million dollars and in exchange became their first licensee. Game over and everyone's a winner. And who says lawsuits don't work? Believe it or not, it was never a very big issue for us. We settled it for less than it cost us to defend it. Then Atari went on the attack against the clones, knockoffs, and pirate versions of Pong that were popping up all over the world. We actually became quite diabolical about seeing ways that we could just mess them up. 
we put a chip in and we purposefully mismarked it so that when somebody copied us, they put the wrong chip in. We felt like we were in a war. It was a war that would change entertainment forever. And as the Atari troops attacked the arcades, Bushnell got ready to open a second front in living rooms across America. The battle for video game dominance was about to begin. In 1974, nearly two years after Pong's introduction, everyone had played the game so much that three quarters of the world's population was suffering from carpal tunnel syndrome. No, not really. But in the arcades, Pong fever was still running hot as ever. And people couldn't get enough. So Nolan Bushnell figured he'd give them more by introducing a home version of Pong. Al Alcorn said, I believe we can put Pong on a chip. And I said, let's do it. This is actually what's inside the coin-operated Pong video game. There's about 75 integrated circuits on this, and that was all replaced by what's in this. Atari cut a deal with Sears, and over 150,000 home Pong units flew off the shelves during the 1975 holiday season. Now the established gaming leader, Atari was the place where top programming talent wanted to be. Steve Jobs showed up unannounced one day, had wanted a job. He was unwashed, unkept, smelled bad, had no degree. Al Alcorn's secretary came to him and said, well, I do, and Al Alcorn's comment was, well, we should either hire him or call the cops. And Al hired him. Jobs brought along a buddy, Steve Wozniak. We hired Steve Jobs, and we didn't know that we sort of got Waz along with the package. Uh, he was never an official employee of Atari, but uh, hung out with Jobs a lot in the labs. They did break out, actually. There was a line of bricks, and he tried to break the bricks away by knocking the ball against them. It was Pong, only it was Pong turned vertical. Pretty soon, Jobs and Wozniak broke out of Atari to start their own little business. Apple Computer. When Jobs asked his boss to invest in the idea. Bushnell declined. The company's capital was tied up producing home Pong units and developing their next home console concept. They called it... The VCS, the video computer system, was the 2600 and became universally known as the Atari. The idea behind the 2600 was to get away from having to build a whole new custom chip for every new game. So if we could make the game just be in a cartridge and software, we could release it much faster and much cheaper than we could with a whole new game. Nolan needed big money to develop and launch the 2600. He got it by selling the company. Warner Communications, headed by Chairman Steve Ross, paid Bushnell $28 million for Atari. Not bad for a $500 investment, plus Nolan would still draw a paycheck as the company chairman. In October of 1977, supported by a handful of games like Street Racer, Indy 500, and Combat, the Atari 2600 hit the streets. It was a bomb. It did nothing. They didn't get them out in time for Christmas. They didn't sell the ones that were out there. And Warner hit the roof. The net result of that was they removed Nolan and put in a, a Ray Kassar, who was a person from the East Coast who worked at Burlington Industries and was probably a more professional, uh, big businessman to run Atari. Nolan was out. But don't cry for this guy. He made even more money with his next business, a chain of family restaurants called Chuck E. Cheese. Now, while all of this was going on at Atari, something even bigger was going on in a galaxy far, far away. In 1977, the movie mega-hit Star Wars sent the nation sci-fi crazy. And in less than a year, a new game arrived that cashed in on the craze. Atari's competitor Midway got the arcade upper hand with a Japanese import that went by the name Space Invaders. We were all fascinated by the Pong machines and then we were fascinated by Space Invaders, which again was, was just lines coming down from the screen. 
Ultimately, you couldn't win. But it was the first arcade machine to record and display a high score. And that just made people want to play more. You look at games today that cost literally millions and millions of dollars and take literally four or five years or more to, to complete. Most of those games don't rival the gameplay and addictiveness of Space Invaders. It took Atari nearly a year, but they did strike back with Asteroids, an updated version of Slug Russell's Space War. The object, break up a surrounding storm of falling asteroids and avoid getting blown up by a fleet of flying saucers. I can remember asteroids like there's no tomorrow, going down there and literally begging my mother for quarters. And then, you know, an hour later I'm back asking for more. It's a good memory for me. The first ones that I played was basically Space Invaders and uh, Asteroids. I always spent my allowance really fast. It was only like five dollars a week. It was like two days and, and I mean I was stretching it as far as I could go. As the 70s disco danced their way into history, 1980 arrived, and true 8-bit color came to the arcade screens. Up until then, any color seen in a game had been achieved by using tinted overlays. Atari was pumping out hits like Missile Command and Battlezone, which had a custom version built for the American military to use in combat training. One of the biggest hits of the year was Defender from Williams, an Atari rival. This was another Fight the Aliens game, but it was cooler because it had a radar screen that let you see everything that was coming your way. But there was one invader no one saw coming. Check him out. He's got a classic profile. His name? Pac-Man. He was born at a Japanese game company called Namco and brought to the U.S. by Atari's nemesis, Midway. Originally called Puckman, Midway was afraid vandals would have too much fun changing the first letter of his name. Small and yellow, he ate everything in his path. Little dots and ghosts with names like Blinky, Pinky, Inky, and Clyde. I love Pac-Man. It was just such a simplistic movement with a joystick, and yet it was easy to play, hard to master. And that was really, I think, the secret of it. It was also the first time a character was the star of a video game. Most important thing about characters? You can license them. Pretty soon, Pac-Man had a song in the Top 40 charts, a Saturday morning TV show, and he even made it to the cover of Time magazine. Then, a year later, Ms. Pac-Man showed up on the scene. Same profile, only this time sporting a bow and a beauty spot. There were also more mazes, more ghosts, and even bigger success. Time to head back over to Japan and a company called Nintendo. They got their start in 1889 manufacturing playing cards. By 1980, under the leadership of Hiroshi Yamauchi, the company was desperate to cash in on the video game craze. Nintendo was doing modestly well in the Japanese arcade business. They could not get a foot in in the U.S. market. In desperation, Yamauchi turned to this guy he had hired named Shigeru Miyamoto. By Japanese standards, Miyamoto was sort of a wild man. When it came to music, he loved the Beatles and bluegrass. He played the banjo, and he loved designing toys. And they said, can you make a game for us? And Miyamoto started spouting off about how he'd do this and he'd do that. And then Yamauchi was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Just make us a good game. Miyamoto came up with something that had never been done in gaming. A story to motivate the action. A gorilla runs away from a carpenter and steals the carpenter's girlfriend. The carpenter chases the gorilla through a factory to rescue the girl. Hey, nobody said it was Shakespeare. Literally translated, Miyamoto's Japanese title for the game came out as Stubborn Gorilla. Wanting something sexier, he went to the Japanese English Dictionary. For Stubborn, he came up with Donkey. Gorilla became Kong. 
The Mauchi called his American headquarters, headed by Minoru Arakawa and Howard Lincoln, and gave everyone the good news on the game. And he said, Donkey Kong. And I mean, they almost passed out. They were like, Donkey Kong? What's a Donkey Kong? I think Howard Lincoln's comment was, Donkey Kong, Conky Dong, I mean, come on. But Donkey Kong was a magic game. Donkey Kong fever swept the arcades, closely followed by Donkey Kong Jr. When it came to merchandising, the monkey was a natural, but it was really the man who became the breakout character. Plans were soon made to give the little guy with the mustache his own game. Everyone knew he had personality, but what he really needed was a name. American Nintendo chief Minoru Arakawa came up with the answer. Originally, he was Jumpman. And the Nintendo's landlord out here, Mario Sigali, pissed off Arakawa. So the Arakawa renamed Jumpman Mario after Mario Sigali. And when Mario got his new name, he also got a new job as a plumber, along with a new brother named Luigi. And the Mario brothers jumped into the arcades in a series of games that are still popular today. By 1982, it seemed like the country was having one great big party. Ronald Reagan was in power, the economy was booming, and the gaming industry was taking a big slice of the disposable income. Americans had now spent over 75,000 man years playing video games and dropped more than 20 billion quarters in the process. It looked like things couldn't get any better. And you know what? They couldn't. The players in the video game industry were about to move up to the next level and face a revolution that would tear the business apart. This was the first game I ever played. There was a machine just like it at the local pizza place. Man, it's still great. Pac-Man, not the pizza. But there was one version of this game that wasn't so hot. In fact, it was so bad that it nearly killed off video games for good. Rewind to 1980. Namco and Midway's Pac-Man is eating up most of the arcade business and cutting into Atari's bottom line. The company had a new president, Ray Kassar, who was a marketing pro. Looking for a new revenue stream, he set his sights on American homes and getting the 2600 console into more of them. Marketing 101. People buy what they know, and people know these guys. Space Invaders had kicked Atari's butt in the arcades back in 1978. Now Kassar thought they were the ones who could save it. In the best can't beat him, join him tradition, he went straight to Taito, the original Japanese company that had designed the game, and bought the rights to a home version of Space Invaders. When it hit stores, 2600 sales skyrocketed. Kassar wanted more. We were asked to do home versions of popular arcade titles. Very difficult task because the Atari 2600 is a very simple game system, electronically. Whereas an arcade game had $4,000 worth of technology in it. Faster than you could say asteroids, more Atari arcade knockoffs hit store shelves. Atari soon had a reputation as a profitable company and a great place to work, but only if you were in upper management. The culture changed at Atari when Bushnell was forced out and the new management came in. They didn't understand the industry, they didn't understand consumer electronics, they didn't understand technology. They had little respect for the creative work that was being done by game designers such as myself. These engineers would create a software program that would result in 20, 30 million dollars in sales. And they were making this little paltry salary and they figured, gee, I'd like to get a penny or two or three for each cartridge. So we go to the president of Atari and point that out. And he said to us, and I'll quote, he said, you are no more important to that game than the person on the assembly line who puts it together. That didn't sit too well with us. Contempt breeds competition. So four of Atari's top game designers gave Kassar the kiss off and started their own company. The blast of light out of your senses. Star Master by Activision. The most significant thing about Activision was that it was the first independent video game publisher. Prior to our formation, all game software was created by the hardware manufacturers. One of the differences with Activision was we promoted the game creator as an author. If you 
creative at what you do, you kind of like some recognition from the public. Activision was a huge success. We grew from zero in revenue to 160 million in revenue in three years. Their first hits included Pitfall, Kaboom, and Freeway. I came up with Freeway on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, which is 10 lanes of traffic. Looked out the window and there was this idiot trying to cross the street. And I'm looking at that and I said, that'd make a good video game. Atari wasn't the only game in town anymore. More companies were making more consoles. Activision was making games for all of them. Magnavox had the Odyssey 2. Famous toy maker Mattel had Intellivision. Mattel's ads for their console featured intellectual literary figure George Plimpton. I've been comparing the exciting new Intellivision space game Star Strike with one of the most popular Atari games, Asteroid. Guess they figured most Americans had to be dragged away from reading War and Peace to play video games. Star Strike features our most exciting visual effect, total destruction of a planet, which is why after Star Strike, asteroids left me rather flat. Total, total destruction of a planet. Then another unlikely player showed up on the field, a plastic pool maker called Coleco. We had looked at this whole arcade position and believed that electronics, as it related to kids, was going to be a very, very important angle. So we started to work on a number of different products that used electronic chips as their heart. And I'm an electronic quarterback. I start in the backfield and follow my blockers. Blockers? I don't have any blockers. Coleco's electronic quarterback. We did the head-to-head -head series of dedicated games where you played against an opponent on the other side of the game. Now we can play at the same time. I'm offense. I'm defense. With head-to-head, -head, you're really in the game. A power sweep. You pass. He blitzes. Intercepts. This is real competition. Then we did the miniature tabletop arcade games, which were miniature versions of Pac-Man and Donkey Kong. They looked exactly like the arcade games. They were very successful, and that put Coleco on the road to developing more video and, uh, you know, electronic games. And a new console called ColecoVision was born. ColecoVision was an attempt to try and replicate as closely as possible in those days the actual experience of the arcade. Knowing they needed a hot game to kick off their console sales, they set their sights on the arcade hit, Donkey Kong. And bought themselves a six month exclusive to the game from Nintendo. ColecoVision became the smash hit of 1982. Donkey Kong was the driver. We impacted it with the unit. <laughs> you bought ColecoVision, you got a Donkey Kong cartridge. Suddenly, another 800-pound gorilla came into the room, Universal Studios. They claimed that Nintendo's Donkey Kong violated their copyright on the movie King Kong, and they wanted their piece of the action. It's a great court case. They actually at one point brought in a Donkey Kong machine and played the game for the judge in the middle of the court, which was quite a scene. But the biggest laugh came when court papers, prepared by Universal's own lawyers, revealed that the original copyright holder had let the rights fall into the public domain. So in the end, not only did they lose, they had to pay damages and court expenses. Hate to say it, but we got it. Nintendo made a monkey out of Universal. And what about those monkeys who were running Atari? They were affected by waves of people leaving the company, first Activision, then there was another wave after us. And so they lost their very best programmers. Desperate, Atari licensed the arcade classic Pac-Man and ordered 12 million cartridges. It sucked. It flickered, it didn't look like Pac-Man, it didn't play well, it was hard to control, it was ugly. It was an awful game. And a financial disaster, big time. Steve Ross, chief of Atari's corporate parent, Warner Communications, decided to step in, and he brought one of Hollywood's biggest talents along with him, Steven Spielberg. In the summer of 1982, E.T. was burning up the box office, and Ross wanted to ride that bike too. He paid a cool $25 million for the right to use Steve's extraterrestrial in a new video game, and he promised to have it out by Christmas. I think they had to develop the game in eight weeks instead of nine months. It's kind of hard to make the game be really fun and have a lot of depth in it in a period of eight weeks. 
and it was so bad. The ones that they sold, most of them were returned. <laughs> in 83, Atari sent diesel trucks into the New Mexico desert, packed with unsold cartridges, and they buried them. The legend was they had to run in and pour concrete over them to make them really go away. Ugly, ugly. It basically killed Atari. It was the end of Atari. By early 1983, it looked like the home gaming boom was going bust for everyone. 30 companies got a couple million dollars in venture capital, hired a couple programmers off the street who'd never designed video games, and developed a video game and tried to sell it, and nobody was buying because it was a piece of garbage. It was ironic because when we saw those 30 new companies, we looked at each other and said, none of these guys are gonna be in business a year from now. And we didn't take that one step further and say, and my God, what that's gonna do to the business. In the next two years, Warner Communications dumped Atari and got out of the industry. Mattel shut down production of their Intellivision system. Coleco sales dropped through the floor. And in 1985, just as everything really hit bottom, Nintendo stood up and said they weren't going to take it anymore and launched their own gaming console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES. Everyone thought they were crazy. All of a sudden, Nintendo came in, better graphics, better color, better sound. Boom, rock and roll, total success. Nintendo has the most video game hits, like baseball and excite bike. Now you're playing with power. They really brought in a new age of video games uh, with the simple introduction of the NES system. They rethought everything. They said, you know, the way cartridges loaded, the way the controllers are designed. So let's start over and create a really friendly game system for families to enjoy. And who was leading the Nintendo NES charge? Their Donkey Kong hero, Mario now starring in Super Mario Brothers. They came out with Super Mario Brothers, which was a great game. So far beyond anything that had existed before in the home. It made side-scrolling vivid, and it gave you puzzles, hidden puzzles and fun puzzles. It characterized what games could be. And it was a phenomenon all, all over again. Once that happened, it really changed the business because then Sega started looking at the business more seriously. Sega was short for service games. It had actually gotten its start as an American company that imported pinball machines to military bases in Japan after World War II. But by 1986, Sega was a Japanese company toiling away in the arcade business. Seeing Nintendo's success, they came out with their first console, the Sega Master System. Most of their games were repackaged arcade titles and couldn't compete with the exciting originals that Nintendo was cranking out. It would take another five years before Sega would get a real shot at pushing Nintendo and Mario off their high ladder. The Japanese really uh, took over the video game industry because we had these games that anyone could play, anyone could understand, and everyone loves. You know, and they're very simple, they're very easy to get into. And the hardware is more powerful than anything we've seen from the American side. So these guys, they were able to bring back video games like they brought it back from the dead. After a five-year slump, consoles were clawing their way back into homes, only to meet a new challenger, a personal computer. We can barely remember life without them, but in the early 80s, these machines were the hot new thing. And they were about to take video game play to a higher level, create new competition for gaming dollars, and give game designers a new opportunity to take even more power into their own hands. You know how some people always seem to be in the right place at the right time? Maybe it has more to do with being ready to step up than just dumb luck. And the video game industry has always been packed with risk takers, people who can't wait to take their shot. Time for another chapter in our tale of two Steves, Jobs and Wozniak. Remember, those two guys who left Atari to start their own thing? By the early 80s, their Apple II home computer was a must buy for tech heads everywhere at a whopping $1,300 a pop. I just thought I have to have one. I convinced my wife that I would somehow make it pay for itself. And we spent well over a month's income for the two of us uh, buying that first Apple II computer. And um, no, I guess I did make it pay for itself eventually. Computers were making word processing a breeze and typewriters were being tossed out of office windows everywhere. But coming out of Atari, the two Steves had gaming in their blood and knew that working hard meant playing harder. 
so they made sure their baby was built to game. Once you have a PC on your desk, you soon realize that it's something that you can goof off on. And right from the very beginning of PCs on desktops in the workplace, there were games to play. In those days, the mid-80s, a lot of them were just text games like Zork. And the great thing about that is because it was all text, it actually kind of looked like work. A rival PC, the Commodore 64, came out in 1982 and was even more successful. 22 million machines were sold in 1983 alone. Well, maybe because that one was only 600 bucks. When the Commodore 64 first came out, I bought one of those like the first day and spent like the next month just learning the machine, trying every last feature of it. And then the first game I did actually was on the Commodore 64. I would go into the college and there were students programming on the Apple so I could ask them, how do you get the dot on the screen? And yeah, I'm just asking them all the basic commands and writing them all down and, and trying to make my own programs in the corner on the machines. I loved playing on a computer a lot more than a console because I felt like the interaction was there. There was a lot more fun um, in actually programming things rather than just being passive and, and letting somebody else make the game for me. That was really when I fell in love with games. Back at Apple, a young employee named Trip Hawkins was getting ready to pull a Steve Jobs on Steve Jobs and take off on his own. At Apple, Steve Jobs was treating him like, you know, a worthless MBA instead of like the future CEO and rock star. The big idea I had was to basically bring a lot of practices from Hollywood into this new digital medium, elevating the development of the product to that of an art form and treating the creative talent as artists. In October of 1982, Electronic Arts was born. We wrote the business plan in November 82, and two weeks later, Atari, which had just shipped E.T., announced that they weren't going to make their revenue and profit targets. What they were doing is they were spending their money on bulldozers, uh, bulldozing all those E.T.s into the ground. We thought cartridge video games were done forever. So we took a big risk when we launched and only did floppy disk PC games. Trip had to get people's eyes back on gaming, and he did it by catching their eye on the store shelves. I immediately gravitated towards thinking that the product should be packaged like a record album. And it was very successful in the marketplace in that you know, a lot of people really liked those early record albums. Tripp also figured sports stars would look great on box covers. Not sure why. Maybe he ate a lot of Wheaties. Whatever the reason, he went after two of the biggest, Larry Bird and Julius Irving, better known as Dr. J. Each got about 25K for a snapshot in their names. And the doctor himself got involved in the game design. We asked him questions about how he played and strategies, and we wanted to understand uh, what kind of shots he would take from different parts of the floor and what his shooting percentages were. We exactly built it into the game. And then we said, imagine you're really going one-on-one -on -one with Larry. What would the outcome be? He goes, if I went one-on-one -on -one with Larry, I beat him every time. Right, cool. Premiering on the Apple II and Commodore 64, Dr. J and Larry Bird go one-on-one -on -one was a huge seller. Next up, football. The tie-in, John Madden. But the big name gave him a big shock. You see, in the early 80s, technology would only allow seven players on each team. Madden looked at it. Yeah. Where's the other guys? Well, this is an Apple II, and you know, it only has 64K RAM. So actually having seven on seven is a huge breakthrough. And it just gets the stink face on it. It's like, where are the other? That's not football. You can ship that if you want, but not with my name on it. You know, we're thinking, he's got our money. So uh, we go back to Robin Antonick, the programmer designer, and say, it's got to be 11 on 11. And he goes, you know. That's impossible. Two years later, when the 11-on-11 11 11 game was finished, we shipped it. And in 1988, the ultimate video sports game franchise was born, along with one of the greatest video game marketing opportunities ever. Like football itself, a new version of Madden started arriving every season. 
with new teams, statistics, and players. And I said, this is the crown jewel, and we're going to build a company around this. This is going to be a hugely successful product. Madden's success proved that sports could be very, very good for EA, and it has, giving birth to a whole subdivision within the company. And it doesn't stop there. From action to adventure, from franchises to tie-in titles, these guys are on it. Now going for over 20 years, they are the biggest and most successful publisher of video games ever. In 2003, the revenues topped $2.5 billion. But hey, we're starting to get ahead of ourselves here. Put the brakes on, and let's rewind back to 1979. This is Ken Williams and his wife, Roberta. Based in LA, Ken had just started a computer consulting business called Online Systems. And then one day, he bought his own computer, along with a computer game. Roberta started playing it, and she got really, really hooked. And after she got hooked, she said, you know, I could do that. And it turned out that she could not only do it, she could do it brilliantly. In 1980, she started writing her own game, Mystery House. The adventure game genre really developed around what the PC was capable of, which was exploration and storytelling. You could type in walk left and you would get a description of, okay, now you're in the field. It was all text-based. An avid movie lover, Roberta loved visuals and insisted the game would be more fun if there were pictures to go along with it. She couldn't understand why the hardware at the time couldn't do the things that she wanted done. And so she would just say, Ken, you've got to make this happen. And somehow Ken would work on it and figure it out some kind of thing and make it happen. Because of her, Ken created this software program that allowed them to store hundreds of uh, graphic screens on one single floppy disk. And they produced the first adventure game for the Apple II that had graphics. They would take these games in a baggie and they'd drive them around the California and have computer shops sell them. And that got successful and, and that became their company. Ken and Roberta sold 80,000 copies of Mystery House. More games started coming. Some were originals. Some adaptations of arcade titles. They also moved their office out of the LA kitchen and into a building just outside Yosemite National Park. Name change time too. The company became Sierra Online. Then IBM knocked on the new office door. They wanted a game for their new consumer machine, the PC Junior. Roberta came up with King's Quest, a fantasy adventure game filled with knights, treasures, and puzzles. It also let gamers play from a third person perspective controlling and moving a character inside a physical world. A first for adventure games. My first experience with King's Quest was just a revelation. It was kind of a very, very early form of virtual reality that I was the main character and I, I was actually creating the story as I went along. I thought that was very exciting as a storyteller and very compelling for me as a gamer. Like the movie biz, success brought sequels and a few spin-offs too. With each game, Roberta's vision expanded, and Ken had to think fast to keep up with it. She said, well, I want color. And he said, well, Apple only has six colors, and they're kind of weird. And she said, well, make more than that. And so he did. She wanted sound. So he convinced Roland to produce a MIDI board and a sound card so that PCs could have music soundtracks. Because of them, the sound cards really came into the PC world. And like Nintendo with Mario, Ken and Roberta knew continuing characters like Leisure Suit Larry could be just as lucrative as franchise titles. The first Leisure Suit Larry game had a very simple plot. You were a 39-year-old uh, virgin software salesman in Las Vegas for one night and hoping to lose your virginity. And you could do that through a variety of means, uh, none of which were very sexy or, <laughs> or, or stimulating, but were funny. That's what made it successful, it was a risque title. Despite all of the success that Sierra and Electronic Arts were finding in the mid-80s, their audience still consisted of a highly specialized group of tech heads and gamers. With computers becoming an everyday part of everyone's work and home life, a money-making stream of potential players was just sitting there, untapped. All someone needed was one simple game. It needed to be something that anyone could play, a game so addictive that workers around the world would have to cover their computer screens when the boss walked by. Well, that game was about to arrive.
In terms of global obsession, this next game broke all the records. It was one of those classic, why didn't I think of that ideas? A game so simple no one in the world could resist playing. It was called Tetris. And next to cocaine, it was the most addictive substance being passed around in the party hardy 1980s. And the idea came right out of Party Central. Well, make that Communist Party Central. In 1984, Alexei Pajitnov was working at the Academy of Science in Moscow. Occupation? Mathematician. His hobby? Puzzles. Alexei came up with Tetris using his computer at work. He based it on an old Russian puzzle game called Pentomino. So this is original Pentomino which I brought from Russia. And I had a, an idea to make two-player game with this. And I start to program it. And when I program it, I see... Well, in order to put it there, you need to flip it or rotate it. That was the moment when Tetris was born. In 1985, the game was ready, and Alexei made his big launch, Soviet style. Release in Russian means that you give the copy to your friends. And that was like a forest of fire, you know. In two weeks, it was on every single PC in Moscow. And Probably in Russia, I don't know. <laughs> and of course, Alexei made a ton of money, retired, and he's been sitting around sipping Stoli in this 30-room mansion ever since. Yeah, right. This was the Soviet Union, remember? It was the communist power in Russia, so basically, at that point, we are agreed that I will grant them all my rights for, for 10 years. So the communists did what any good capitalist would do. They sold the rights to Tetris around the world. It started showing up on U.S. computers in January of 1988. Soon everyone was playing. At home, at work, on company time, personal time. It didn't seem to matter. The nation was transfixed. Kids, ask your parents. If they say they never played Tetris, they're lying. Tetris is very intuitive. Kids are very good in Tetris. Adult people, even senior people like these games. Everybody finds something <laughs> for himself with this game. Smelling a hit, Nintendo used Tetris to launch Game Boy, their new handheld gaming device. The very big part of the Tetris success is connected to Game Boy. Somehow this platform and this game was born for each other. Game Boy with Tetris was sold in the number of 30 million. It's pretty big number. <laughs> Not only was the game a hit, it helped establish the Game Boy as a viable and popular gaming platform that could move software in numbers that rivaled consoles and PCs, and continues to do that kind of business today. The best part of the story? In 1996, Tetris writes Return to Alexei. Now instead of Stoli, he's sipping Starbucks in Seattle, where he works with Microsoft. And new generations are discovering Tetris on a variety of platforms, including mobile phones. We collect and distribute royalties for the game. They are not that big <laughs> anymore, but, but it's, still, it's still good. As the 1990s kicked in, Nintendo was riding high. Not only was the Game Boy doing great, but Nintendo had single-handedly rebuilt the home console market, leaving Atari and the toy makers in the dust. The NES was the leader of the pack with their lock on hit titles and game franchises. Sega was also hanging in there with their master system. They decided it was time to challenge Nintendo's supremacy, and in 1989, Sega launched the Genesis console. When the Sega Genesis came out, uh, it really brought video games to the next generation of technical capabilities. Our agency created the slogan, Genesis does what Nintendo don't, which meant we have a 16-bit system, they have an 8-bit system. It was the first competitive position in the video game industry in terms of home game systems. In the no-holds-barred campaign, Sega rolled out their secret weapon, a blue hedgehog called Sonic. They said, you know what, this is going to be our mascot. He's going to have more of an attitude. He's going to be here toward a slightly older audience, and he's going to be fast. 
they used to show Sonic just like whizzing by on the screen and just going super fast while Mario is just kind of jumping up and down and they've really made Mario out to be some kid's character while Sonic was, hey, this is the next hottest thing. And this sound, Sega! heard at the end of every Sega commercial, piled on the attitude. While Sega and Nintendo were fighting over the home market, gamers were heading back to the arcades, where the games were more graphic and intense. Games like Street Fighter II and Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat is a game where after you've beaten your opponent, you can put in what's called a fatality, and you can rip out their spine and their skull, or stick your hand into their chest and pull out their heart, or a whole bunch of other really grisly little endings. Both Sega and Nintendo wanted to match the visual quality of these intense arcade games. Sega saw possibilities in a new format, the CD-ROM. One CD could hold 320 times more data than a console cartridge. To you and me, that's just more gaming power. But just as Sega began to consider the CD-ROM, personal computers beat them to the punch. In 1993, a new game designed for the Macintosh home computer made its debut. Blue pages. It was designed by Rand and Robin Miller, two brothers who had found modest success designing children's computer games. Working out of their garage in Spokane, Washington, they crafted an immersive, interactive world. Mist. Typically, games start with a gameplay system. Ours start with a place. In our minds, we were building real places that people could lose themselves in. They'd sit down in front of their computer, they'd turn the lights down, turn the sound up, and they'd forget that they were in this world and they would feel like they were in that world. The graphics in Mist were what defined it. Because for the first time, I think people saw stuff on their screen that could be mistaken for real images or real places. There were some terrific constraints, like we couldn't actually move the pictures in real time. Um, so we built them very realistic, but they were, they were still. Mist was the killer app for CD because it allowed for this uh, incredible wealth of graphics that we had really never seen before. Floppy disk just couldn't handle the size of these graphics. Mist became the must-have game, selling 250,000 copies in 12 months. It stayed on computer game bestseller lists for the next three years, selling over four million copies. It also turned the Miller brothers into millionaires. I smile because I look back and think when we were two stupid brothers sitting in the garage, we didn't have great insight. We maybe had some good instincts and the timing was right. For loads of gamers, Mist was a watershed moment with its enchanting magical graphics helping to create a completely immersive experience. But the next killer application for multimedia PC would follow arcade games down a much darker, more brutal road. And suddenly, the video game industry would find itself in a head-on collision with the U.S. government. Twenty years after the awesome success of Pong, video games had morphed from a geeky hobby for computer engineers to addictive entertainment for the masses. And like all success stories, the industry soon attracted the attention of big business and lawmakers. Okay, let's back up to 1981 for a second. This is the original Castle Wolfenstein, a classic let's fight the Nazis computer game. When it came to action gaming, this was as good as it got. But just 11 years later, technology would take it from this to this. Wolfenstein 3D was the brainchild of id Software, a company run by two young game designers named John Carmack and John Romero. Based in Texas and both in their early 20s, they were hardcore gamers with a passion for movies like Aliens and Evil Dead, and a love for heavy metal music. Combine these influences with Carmack's recent mastery of smooth scrolling 3D graphics for the PC, and you got one of 1992's breakout computer games, especially when the buzz got out about its blood and gore content. People were quite literally blown away by it because they never seen anything like this. And it really showed that 
there could be this whole interesting, compelling, edgy gaming experience on a PC that you weren't able to find uh, on consoles or necessarily in arcades. It was also one of the first games to be played through a first-person perspective. Since you needed to shoot a lot of people to win, it helped coin the video game genre title, First Person Shooter. First Person Shooter is where your eyes are the monitor, basically, and you get to see your hands or your weapons or whatever in front of you, so it's you. And First Person to us was the most successful interface that there was, because you didn't have to think about anything but just what you're doing in the game. But the best thing about Wolfenstein 3D was the way it was sold. With more and more computers hooking up to the internet, Carmack and Romero could take advantage of a new distribution system called Shareware. Shareware was a really, really radical concept at the time because what it basically meant is that you would be giving games away online, portions of the game, hoping that people got hooked. Here's the first third in a trilogy that you get for free, and you leave them with a cliffhanger and all this stuff, so they have to buy the other two. And it was like crack basically, uh, over the internet. And a lot of people got hooked on Wolfenstein's hardcore style. 18 months later, Carmack and Romero gave them their next fix. The game was called Doom. December 10th of 1993, when we released Doom, uh, we'd been up for about 30 hours before that working. It was trying to get this uploaded, but there were so many people waiting online that it could not get in to upload it. And the files in the drive should have been an empty directory, but people were putting sentences in there as file names. They're making, when will it be here, you know, and hurry up and stuff. It's like a whole directory full of sentences, and we're just like, these people are insane. What it had to do was to tell everybody to just back off, don't come on for a few minutes while they upload the game. When it came to graphic action and intensity, Doom pushed it farther than Wolfenstein and was an even bigger success. My most seminal gaming experience was playing Doom with my headphones on late at night with my wife asleep in the other room and being really terrified. And feeling stupid for being terrified, but still being terrified. The other thing that made Doom appealing to gamers was its multiplayer capabilities. Go, go, go. Network a few computers together, and you could start shooting at your buddies Go inside the same back. game. Here they come, here they come. Carmack and Romero called it deathmatching. But through all of pretty much 1994, I was just addicted to deathmatch. It was just the coolest thing I'd ever experienced in my entire life. For two young guys in their 20s, the success of Doom was a dream come true. Practically overnight, the id Software founders had become multi-millionaires. I totally had fun buying, you know, fun cars and houses and all that kind of stuff. Romero would show up at gaming conventions and there would be people literally bowing at his feet and doing the Wayne's World, I'm not worthy. They really were the rock stars at that time. And then when all of the controversy came out of for violent games, then they had all of that too to, to kind of stoke their image. In the year leading up to Doom's release, violent video games had become headline newsmakers but not in a good way. The popularity of games like Street Fighter II and Mortal Kombat among young children and teenagers had parents and lawmakers blaming video games for everything, from unfinished homework to antisocial behavior and rising street crime. In late 1993, the issue was picked up by Connecticut Senator Joseph Lieberman, who formed a Senate committee to investigate video game violence. We're not talking about Pac-Man or Space Invaders anymore. We're talking about video games that too often glorify violence and teach children to enjoy inflicting the most gruesome forms of cruelty imaginable. We are calling on the video game industry today to recognize its responsibility to the parents and children of this country. Lieberman's Senate committee wagged their finger at an uncensored version of Mortal Kombat and an obscure game called Night Trap. In the game, you play a guy who's trying to protect a house full of um, sorority girls that are being attacked by these fledgling vampires who apparently don't have fangs yet, so they use this grill contraption that hooks up to the neck and sucks their blood out. 
game wasn't selling. It wasn't fun. It was a silly game. Lieberman called it gratuitous and offensive and ought not to be available to people in our society. His comments turned Night Trap into one of the biggest selling games of the year. The other result of the government hearing was that all major game producers agreed to set up the Entertainment Software Rating Board to rate games. Violence didn't go away, but now it came with a warning. I was actually a key proponent in the creation of the rating system for video games. So I'm a big believer in honest packaging and providing consumers with all the information they need to make a good product decision and to know what they're getting. You don't let your kids see R-rated movies. You shouldn't let your kids play M-rated games. And once that becomes more ingrained in American culture in everyone's minds, then the whole violence issue in video games will become less of an issue. With the government battle behind them, Sega and Nintendo were now free to start beating each other up in the marketplace again. Sega fired the first volley by announcing their plan to launch a new home system called the Saturn, which would operate exclusively from a CD-ROM drive. Nintendo said, well, if they're going to do it, we've got to do it. And so Nintendo partnered with Sony, and they created a CD player for the Super Nintendo called the PlayStation. Only then Nintendo decided, you know what? We don't trust Sony very much. And they partnered up with Philips. They left Sony standing at the altar. And as anyone who's been left at the altar knows, revenge can be sweet. Nintendo's and Philips' plans for a CD-ROM system began to fall apart, and consumer electronics giant Sony decided they could make it in the video game industry all by themselves. They kept the name PlayStation, which I think was a real thumbing of the nose at Nintendo. Everybody knows Sony as a company that makes Walkmans and electronics, and then gradually over time, consumers have accepted that Sony represents really good quality stuff. It just, it was a natural progression. And then with the PlayStation, uh, they just dropped the bomb. It was incredible. The Sony PlayStation hit the shelves in September 1995 and immediately left Sega's new system, the Saturn, in the dust. Technologically, you could tell that the Saturn was way behind the PlayStation. The PlayStation handled 3D. All of a sudden, there was no competition because here's Sony, they've got a better unit. The unit's $100 cheaper, and they've got all the games. You can't compete with something like that. Especially when Lara Croft was playing on their team. Thank you. When Tomb Raider first came out in 1996, it was only available for the PlayStation. We had not only a female lead character, but a sexy one, you know, who had big boobs and short shorts. She became really popular, and the game itself was incredible. So Tomb Raider was one of the key games that helped make PlayStation. Two of the other games that helped push the PlayStation to success were a fighting game called Tekken and Crash Bandicoot. Crash did for Sony what Mario and Sonic had done for their competitors, and the character became sort of an unofficial PlayStation mascot. Sega just couldn't compete with the might of Sony. In 1999, Sega launched another console, the Dreamcast. It bombed. Sega quietly dropped out of the console market to concentrate on game development. Sony planned to follow up the PlayStation with the PlayStation 2, which would be more of a multimedia machine, able to play CD music and DVD movies. But just when it looked like Nintendo would be the only competition, a Seattle-based company decided it was time to get into the business. Oh, and that company was just about the biggest in the US, Microsoft. There are a lot of people saying, you know, Sony's going to replace the PC with PS2. It occurred to me that uh, the only way to really counter that would be to make a dedicated device, to make a game console. But Microsoft was all about software and had trouble convincing people in the game business that they knew what they were doing. And we had about six months of not really being taken seriously because, you know, I would show up or, you know, some other guys would show up and say, hey, we're from Microsoft and we're making a game console that will compete with Sony now. That's a hard thing to say. That's like saying, we're from the government, we're here to help. But it turned out that Microsoft did know what they were doing. Four, three, two, one. They even got the fact that hardware was useless without killer games. 
When the software giant released the Xbox in 2001, they had an exclusive on a new first-person shooter, Halo. If you, you look at, at successful console launches, and you'll see the console becomes a player for the, the popular game. The Xbox became the Halo player. Yes, this black device with the green circle on it plays Halo. Halo is a big hit because the critics loved it, then the hardcore gamers really picked up on it, and then word of mouth spread. Microsoft might have established their gaming credentials, but along with Nintendo's new mini disc system, the GameCube, the Xbox was still chasing the market leader, Sony's PlayStation 2. Now some of the biggest multimedia corporations in the world were gaining control of the video game industry. Real proof that there were big bucks to be made and that video games were now a major part of the entertainment business. And as entertainers, the game designers would have to keep the hits coming. Games today have gone way past the run, jump, and shoot basics of the early titles. Instead of blowing up aliens and aiming for high scores, gamers are looking for a more realistic, immersive, and open-ended experience. And the gaming audience is changing too. Boys, girls, men, women, they're all getting into games big time. Whether it's attempting to execute a 900 on a skateboard from the safety of your couch, or deciding how much to tax the residents of your very own virtual city. Back in the late 80s, Will Wright, a young programmer and hardcore gamer, was fascinated by how cities and societies work. Urban planning might not sound like the next hot thing in entertainment, but Will thought it was a great idea for a game. Well, SimCity was basically a game where you're designing a city. It's almost like a paint program in a way. You have a palette of parts, but the parts in this case are things like roads or industrial zones or schools. And as you paint, things happen. You know, people start building houses, traffic appears on the roads, there's pollution, there's crime. So we released it in 89. It was a very different sort of game at the time. You know, at that time, still, most games were very action-oriented, very clear goals. And at first, we were having a hard time getting anybody to even play it. Until a rave review in Newsweek put SimCity on the map and sent sales of the game through the roof. And a new gaming franchise was born. But the big payday came when Will applied his simulation concepts to the human form. When The Sims debuted in February of 2000, players could now build simulations of actual people and run their lives. It's effectively a dollhouse where you get to lead a virtual life and really fun to play. I think it's one of the most innovative games ever made. The Sims is one of the games that my daughter will play. It's one of the games that my wife will play. Sims is one that they're immediately drawn to. Will Wright wasn't the only one giving gamers the power to build their own world. 5,000 miles east of Silicon Valley, in England to be exact, British designer Peter Molyneux also had a new take on gameplay. Instead of playing a hero, or instead of playing a character, or a plumber, or a hedgehog, why don't you play God? That's the most powerful thing that you could possibly be. Molyneux's game, Populous, sold over four million copies and gave birth to a new genre, the God game. And rather than actually controlling a single character, with your godly powers, you influence lots of little characters. Just as when you were little kids and you were setting up your G.I. Joes in the sandbox or whatever, you're doing the same thing now, but with digital toys. If some gamers got juiced being God, others wanted to get their kicks by playing with a bunch of friends inside the virtual world of a game. When the internet exploded in the 90s, technology was able to deliver their fantasy. One of the first games to really hook into the concept was Carmack and Romero's 1996 follow-up to Doom, Quake. Quake enabled 16 people to play over the internet, and um, that really just blew it open. There started to be teams of gamers, and they called themselves clans. All right, go, go, now. I just wake up in the morning and can't wait to go hop on the game and see who's there, or say hi, or pop in and go kill people. <laughs> Not exactly the usual way to win friends and influence people. Within months of Quake's release, some of the clans decided to have a get-together so they can meet face-to-face. -face. QuakeCon is really a grassroots event. It was about 50 guys that, uh, that wanted to get together because they met online and thought, well, we'll just 
do it in Texas. And it just grew. This has become a yearly vacation. It's my time to just have fun, stay up late, sleep late, meet people I play against online. We're in a senior gaming league and we have our own competition. Anyone over the age of 35 can play. I just have fun. We came out here to meet our fellow uh, teammates that we play on. It's NADS, North American Destroyers. And our NADS set up a group for the younger children. We call them NITS, NADS in Training. Seven years on from their first fan fest, QuakeCon attracts over 5,000 players every summer. Texas in August, they've got to love Quake. It seemed people couldn't get enough of playing in big groups, so game designers started coming up with games that thousands of computer gamers could play online. When you go from 16 or 8 or 32 people to thousands, it's massively multiplayer. A massively multiplayer game is where you are running the game on your PC and thousands of other people are connecting to the server and that connection is allowing you to interact with the game and communicate with others. Hot titles included Ultima Online, Lineage, and EverQuest, the brainchild of John Smedley. In 1999, he persuaded Sony to create a whole new customer service online so that 30,000 people could play at once. We make a world for people to play. On EverQuest, we have a 60-person team that does nothing but make this world unique every day. So when they come into work, they're changing creatures, they're adding new quests, they're, they're looking at what the players have done and, and saying, okay, that's a little too easy for them, let's tweak that, or maybe that's too hard. There are dragons and orcs and fairies and giants and all sorts of creatures. And it's supposed to be a virtual world to the extent that whether you're logged on or not, the world keeps going. So much for the stereotype of a nerdy gamer playing on his own. Now gamers, including women, were joining forces to take on the challenges of EverQuest. Women are really into forming the relationships, and so women do go to these worlds. You often find that they become community leaders. They become the center of a social group. Soon, millions of computer gamers around the world were logging on to massively multiplayer games. PlayStation and Xbox jumped on the bandwagon in 2002 when they made the latest versions of their consoles internet friendly. The console online scheme is really just a response to the PC. They're looking at what's happening on the PC and saying, well, we can do that too. If the game is entertaining and you put it online and it's entertaining online, then it's awesome. It's entertainment square. If it's a bad game and you put it online, you're just spreading the misery around in a more efficient way. You probably won't believe it when we tell you this, but not everyone plays games for fun. Remember how back in 1980 the U.S. Army ordered a special version of Battlezone from Atari to train the troops? The Marines even had their own version of Doom in 1994 to teach teamwork skills. 21st century Army recruits are tech savvy and into video games big time. So it made sense for the military to tap into all that expertise. With these kids playing 13 hours, 20 hours a week video games, these thumbs are very agile. They know joysticks, they know triggers, and they said, let's just make our interfaces like that, and we're already over the first hurdle in getting them to kind of feel comfortable in these systems. In 2002, the Army gave away a game called America's Army to the American public. Intended to test wannabe GIs, it turned into a smash hit. Then. They drafted Pandemic Studios onto a top secret project. They wanted a game that would get recruits ready for combat without putting them at risk. Full Spectrum Warrior. It's not a war game where you're running around and celebrating the fact that you're killing people. Your goal is to advance to a certain location or secure something to make sure your men are safe. It's a very different take on other military games. The Army also had a plan to create a retail version of Full Spectrum Warrior. Of course, the G.I. Joe game needed a few tweaks to make it play for Joe Public. The Army product was made for sergeants who were already fully trained, years of experience. We couldn't make that assumption with the average game player. So it's up to us to teach as you play all of the Army tactics that the soldiers have spent years learning. It's a design challenge because we're moving away from the sim into the purely entertainment aspect of the game. So we're trying to find creative ways to keep it authentic, but also keep the pace going. 
keep you moving forward, get the action level up a bit. Playing the commercial version might just be one of the best recruiting tools the Army could dream of. Video games actively improve your hand-eye coordination and uh, can train you directly in things that are relevant to the military. If you're planting those seeds in your head when you're really young, hey, you want to be a super soldier or you want to play games, the Army is the place to go. It's pretty ironic that the same government that a few years ago hammered the video game industry for damaging young minds is now using the same tools to hook and train their raw recruits. The video game industry is still full of surprises, and now the biggest surprises are not just the games themselves, but who's playing, how many billions of dollars are involved, and who wants to be part of the action. So video games have been with us since the 1970s, moving from arcades to home consoles to handhelds and cell phones like this. They've become essential entertainment for a whole generation, and with gross revenues of over $20 billion a year, the video game industry is making more money than the movie business. But they also continue to be a lightning rod for controversy. Anytime there's trouble in society, video games still get a big chunk of the blame. In 1999, two students went on a horrific shooting spree at their school in Columbine, and as society searched for a reason, people began to blame video games. There was a videotape, much later I think, released of uh, Eric Harris talking about how shooting up the high school is gonna be just like doom, and the press ran with it. They just said, you know what, this is bad for America's morality. It's corrupting kids, and it's causing kids to do all sorts of bad things, when there's quite a bunch of problems making kids do bad things nowadays. There's no correlation between video games and human violence. Human violence has always been with us. We're in a society where politicians and the special interest groups pick on the new media. It just underscores the fact that it's not about video games at all. And with recent titles like Max Payne and the Grand Theft Auto series, the controversy continues. Who knows if it will ever end? In 2004, 145 million Americans are playing video games. That's more than half of us. And they're not all lonely teenage kids sitting in a dark room, playing for hours on end. People still have this idea, particularly in the United States, that games are something for 14-year-old skater criminals to do to avoid doing their homework. And when you point out that, you know, the middle of our demographic is, you know, the 26-year-old with a lot of expendable income is probably professional, they just refuse to believe it. The female gaming population is actually the quickest growing segment of the video game business. Almost every girl my age has played a game in her life and would not call herself a gamer, but is. Now, 28% of video gamers are women. And for PC players, the numbers are even higher, 41%. With such a diverse audience, the industry has to use every available resource to keep them hooked. Thanks to the mega processing power of 21st century computers, programmers have been able to develop artificial intelligence, which means that non-player characters in games can apparently think for themselves. What artificial intelligence should do is look at what you, a player, enjoy and what you, you a player, doesn't enjoy and adapt the game accordingly. Not only adapt the challenges you face, the opponents you face, but uh, adapt the storyline, adapt the world itself. Yes, ultimately, we could all be playing the same game, and, uh, uh, but, but um, having a completely different experience. Sports games are still huge, and they've kept up with the explosion of action sports like snowboarding and BMX, and a little thing called skateboarding. And there's some games here I can really recommend. With the latest one called Tony Hawk's Underground, you can email a picture of yourself to Neversoft, download it from their server, you match up the points to your face, and you're in the game. It's pretty cool if I say so myself. Whoa, not bad. Where are you from? I came all the way down from New Jersey for the Tampa Am. Talk about a surprise attack. If you stay on your board tomorrow, you'll walk away with the contest. Another method of customizing games has been around since the early 90s, when John Carmack and John Romero put out software that let gamers make their own versions of Doom. Just like Hot Rodders personalizing their cars, Gamers could now modify, or mod, Doom. 
bringing the gaming experience to a new and even more personal level. Game over, man! I had put out all the information out there for how the sectors and line segments and everything everything was, was organized. So everyone had the information, they could write tools for it, and that was the start of the whole mod scene. Doom spawned this whole culture of mod making, which was incredibly far-reaching and important because it was really weaning the next generation of game developers. Check it out. The next wave of designers can even go to school to learn how to create video games. For me, game design is a design field, like architecture. It should have courses, departments, whole schools dedicated to it. At schools like USC and the DigiPen Institute of Technology in Seattle, a degree in game design is more than just a workout for the thumbs. We want to teach people how to be critical thinkers about this rich medium that there isn't historically a lot of academic grounding to. We have the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Fine Arts. You may not have bargained for so much math, you may not have bargained for so much physics. You thought that if you played video games, you're going to be good at it. Having more game-related studies in a university context is part of what needs to happen for games to become a more mature pop cultural medium. But future graduates will have to be pretty determined because none of the video game pioneers are going away anytime soon. After 30 years in the business, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell is still coming up with ideas. His latest is called U-Wink, Inc. Touchscreen coin-operated games. We're generally in adult locations. Simple games, a little bit Atari-esque if you would. Games that are well produced and operate for adults. So you can sit down, you can play for a few minutes and have a good time. And Nolan's first company, Atari, has changed hands a few times and hit rock bottom more than once, but they've stormed back with a slew of hit games like Enter the Matrix and Unreal Tournament. The Rockstar designers are also looking at new ways to deliver great games to us. Everyone's got a cell phone, right? With a cell phone, you can play video games anytime, anywhere. Even though the handset may not have a lot of computing power itself, it's connected to an incredibly vast uh, computer network. I saw that now, Mobile devices like PDAs uh, had the power to actually play games well on them. You know, that's always kind of going in the back of my mind is how can I do something else that I think would be a killer app for this new platform. With all those guys still pushing the envelope and new designers joining their ranks every day, we can't even imagine what games are going to look like 10 years from now. In just a few short decades, video games have led an entertainment revolution. Movies, television, they haven't been the same since video games arrived on the scene. There's a perception in the game industry that games are in their infancy. We've achieved a lot, but we're far from where it's going to be. And more than that, they continue to massively impact every aspect of our culture, influencing everything from education to the military. People really do wonder, how can you play that damn thing for 40 hours? I mean, think of 40 hours a game. It must be deep, it must be doing something for you. So the emotional experience we have with games is something everybody can have with games. As the debate over their violence and addictiveness rages on, video games also continue to drive the leading edge of computer technology, opening players' minds to new concepts of strategy and tactical thinking, and capturing the attention of the world in bold and unexpected ways. In the next 20 years, the person who is in the White House will have played Super Mario Brothers. And what will that mean for the way that they think about policy or the way they think about resource distribution or the way they think about problem solving? People in their 30s who grew up playing this stuff are now paying attention to it and we don't think twice about it. And we don't think these games are just for kids. We don't think these games are destroying the fabric of youth. For us it's just like music, it's just like TV, it's just like film. It's part of life. Thanks to the vision of the guys behind the games, there's no limit to where they'll take us in the future. The video game invasion is just beginning.